glad to have you here. And um, I know you're disappointed they uh, canceled uh, a, uh, class in A1, but uh, he is uh, not, he was under the weather, not feeling well, so uh, he just pushed you in here. So you're in here with us, and I'm glad to have you, glad to have each of you. Uh, we have been, and I'll tell you in a second, but uh, we have been uh, talking about the life of Joseph, so you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to Genesis, and that would be where we are, we talking about today will be Genesis 39. Get you lined up there, and then go ahead and let you know that there are Many that uh, we've been praying for, and we've had a lot of our prayers answered, people recovering, doing better. Those of you that weren't aware, Steve Schaefer was to go into surgery last week, but it got canceled, and we have not heard about uh, when that will happen, but we will inform everybody when it does. But we've got a lot of people recovering, a lot of people still uh going through some trials physically, but you know about them, and we hope you'll continue to pray for them and do what you can to assist them. But uh, as we begin this morning, let's bow together in prayer. Our God and Father, we're truly humbled to be able to bow before you. The group of saints that meet here are Constantly, Father, lifting up your name, trying in all, all our efforts to glorify you, and we pray that will continue. We thank you for the many blessings that we enjoy, each and every one of us, all the things that you have provided for us. We know every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we are thankful for that. We're thankful for your word that we're able to open today. We're thankful for the wonderful godly characters you have put before us in your word and as we study and continue to think about the life of joseph we pray there will be things that we will mention and talk about today that help each of us as we go through life but thank you for putting them there for us to look at and learn from be with those that are recovering from their different medical needs medical problems they've had but we pray that you will be with them Help us be directed in some way to assist when we can, to be servant of them, be with the caregivers. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mention that. But if you didn't hear Christine, if you follow the church Facebook, Range Jackson has been able to be reunited at home in Japan with his family. And there are some pictures there if, on Facebook if you wish to see him. And Art's here, and he can tell us a lot about some of that. We had some others that, uh, you know, going through the same kind of uh, issues, but uh, that just a wonderful blessing. All the prayers have been answered on his behalf. I want to let you know, if you weren't in our class, we have talked about many things having to do with the life of Joseph. And you can go back and begin to read about the life of Joseph if you wish to. Uh, we're not going to go back to the beginning and start over, but we will just start with this, that in his life, he faced a lot of traumatic experiences all the way from being thrown in a pit by his brothers because of their jealousy built up their resentment to him and then we see him come out of that and that's where we will be today in Genesis 39 we see him leave on a life of bitterness uh, I think many of us if we were treated that way by our family by our brothers and I I'm one that would understand brothers a little bit, having had five of them, but I can't ever even imagine being so mad that I would do that to one of my brothers, but we know that he was thrown in a pit, and we will be at a point today where we see that he is sold into slavery. But the point I need to make more than anything is that 
he is one that is such a great example for us because he overcame an awful lot and God was with him and that's where we ended up last week. But we were talking about bitterness. And bitterness is not something that just Joseph felt, but it is addressed so many times in the New Testament. So I know it is not only a problem back then, it continues to do, be with mankind today. And so that's kind of where we left off and that's where we'll start today. So to get us going, tell me what you think in your mind what bitterness means. What is bitterness? How, 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 what causes me or you to become bitter? What causes that? Yes, sir. The way one treats you? Anybody else? Very good. Jealousy. Okay. Anger, resentment, jealousy. Yes? Amen. It will eat you up, and that's the, that's the reason that we, or I suggested we think about the life of Joseph, because I want you to picture yourself at age 17 being the favorite and being tossed in the pit by people you're supposed to, that are supposed to love you. You don't think there'd be some resentment and some bitterness? Sure there would. So we can learn a lot from him about that. The Word of God covers so much. If you have your Bible, you can turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, if you wish to. Uh, verses 31 and 32, I'm just going to read them for you. The Apostle Paul tells us, told the Ephesians, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speak, and be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, as Christ, forgave you. That's an awful lot of things that fit right in there with bitterness. But we are supposed to eliminate that from our life. Now, we need to remember that it starts out talking about that God was with Joseph. We'll read about that in a few minutes, and we'll go through as we talk about that. But God was with him. Book of Colossians, Paul again addresses, and it's good for us to hear. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, put them all out of your mouth. And as I said, anger and wrath are part of what builds up the bitterness. And I can just imagine what he must have felt. I don't know how, how far he fell in a pit, but we find out the pit, if you read through that story, the pit didn't have water in it, so I'm assuming it is a cistern, a well back in that time. But could you imagine just being tossed in there in the dark and left there alone? I mean, I would be bitter. I think all of us would, somebody treating you that way. So we can learn a lot from his attitude as he moves forward and the things that happen. A question for us as New Testament Christians, and we talked a little bit about it last week, but since we have a new group, let me go ahead and ask you, all that were here, all of you that are here, how long should you or I, how long should we let anger or bitterness toward another remain in our life? Because Let me just tell you before, I, before you answer, some of us are still better about things that people have done to us. Some of us still remain angry and can, with the person's name being just mentioned, we can go off and just run down a list of things that I am still bitter or angry about. So I ask the question, how long does that remain? How long should it remain? Yes, sir. perfect answer. Yes, sir. Got to be done with it, right? Exactly. And that's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 26. When you're angry, when you're upset, when you are bitter, do not sin. And there's a lot of things that could fit in there, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So we need to eliminate it. We cannot 
carry it forward. We talked about, you and I, or last week, yes, sir, Denny, sorry. Very good. Everybody hear Denny? Anger is only one letter away from the word danger. And that's exactly right. And that's what the Word of God is trying to tell us. And that's what Joseph displayed to us. And that's what we were trying to get across last week. You know, we talk about getting thrown in a pit. I mean, I can just imagine. Could you imagine being thrown in prison like it's getting ready to happen to him? Well, you just let bitterness and uh, anger swell up in you. It's worse than being in jail in prison because I used the example last week. Teaching in school, I would be, somebody would be upset with me walking toward me in the hallway at school and they would stop. They'd walk around to the other hallway, circle around so they wouldn't have to do what? Come face to face with me. And that's what bitterness and anger will do to you. But in this life, I wanted you to know how well he displayed it. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Great point Sandy makes. Don't let bitterness last. You, sometimes you go to sleep with it, but you wake up, but you can't let it affect your salvation. And that is a great point. And that's what happens in this life of Joseph, a lesson that we can learn about it, that he does not continue to just harp on it. He just goes on with the things that God would have him to do. Okay, when we are angry or I'm upset with you about something you've done, and I'm bringing Joseph back to the New Testament here for us and I, for our class. Uh, when we're angry with somebody and we feel mistreated, there are certain things that we need to do to resolve that problem. What needs to happen in my life as a Christian? What do I need to display right away in that? Okay. Okay. Does anybody have a, uh, I was trying to get to the thing of a order that we kind of go through. Tell me what you do when your brother sins against you. Are there certain things that we can read? Because this has to do with that. It has to do with that going on. What happens in the book of Matthew? What does he tell us to do in Matthew 18? Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay. And you notice whose responsibility it is. Yeah, please, please notice that. And that's, that's what I wanted us to focus on this morning as we were getting away from bitterness and resentment. It is my responsibility to go as a Christian. And as the Word of God tells us, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between, guess who? Not the church, between you and him alone. Go get it straightened out. That's the way it needs to happen. And listen, if it won't happen, if he won't listen to you, you need to get somebody else and go and again try to get it straightened out. And then if that won't happen, I would even suggest you go get another couple of people and go try to get it resolved. And then it says in the book of Matthew, we take it to the church. But we cannot let it eat us up. And it will put you in jail. Bitterness and resentment. And if you were 17 and these things happen, there is a chance in your mind, but that's why this character is so good for us to study and learn about. He never left, got, got out of God's way. Okay, how important do you think it is that we forgive others? Since we're on bitterness and we're talking about going to see him, how important it is? Excuse me? Okay. If you can't forgive that person, you can't be forgiven. Okay, so we see that displayed in Genesis 39. We see it displayed. I mean, immediate. He has no resentment. He has nothing to hold against them. He immediately does that. So I'm going to ask you, if they do it again, give me a number. How many times do I need to forgive that 
Oh, wait, and let's move it from a brother to a sister because I didn't have any. So, so, and they ask, hey, can you tell me how many times I got to forgive somebody? Can you give me a number, Jesus? And he said, listen, there's no number. Seventy times seven is what is displayed in our word. But what does that really tell you? That is an ongoing process. So I want you to, with me, think about that heart that Joseph had. And you know, even though they are trying to do you evil and continue to do evil to you, he just kept moving forward with God with him. Yes, sir. Very good. So, <laughs> you think about that. If I'm not forgiving others, I'm not being forgiven. Okay. Very good. Good point. Anyone else? Anything? Yes, sir. Jody? Right. I didn't mean they forgave them right away. Maybe I said it the wrong way, but you're exactly right. He doesn't forgive them till later when he encounters them again. You're exactly right. But I, my point is he did not do anything to retaliate right away. He had no power to do anything. And remember, God is with him, moving him along, and that was, I hope, the point I was trying to make. He doesn't allow... Joseph, in this story, does not allow years of being in slavery, first of all, and then in prison without any cause of being in either one other than just cruelty to him. He does not, it does not make him bitter, and it does not put him in a place where he forgets about God. Now, remember, God is with him the whole time. Uh, if you have your Bible open, notice what it says in uh Genesis 39, and I'll read there one and two. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him, excuse me, from the Is Ishlamites, who had taken him down there, and the Lord was with Joseph. That's the first time we find out the Lord is with him. And then if you'll look over in 39.3, it goes on to say, the Lord was with Joseph again. It says he was a successful man, was in the house of the master of the Egyptian, and the master saw that God was with him. Okay? So we've got an Egyptian seeing, uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week. What do you think it means by saw something displayed in him that God was with him? Anybody? What are some, some characteristics that, yes, sir? Okay. Okay. But this is before he even gets to the dreams, but that's a good point. So what, I asked this last week, and we probably will get a few more answers, or different answers. Tell me how somebody would know that you're walking with God today or you're trying to display that. What would be some of the recognizable characteristics? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The way you act, the way you live, the way you talk. Righteous deeds. Okay. Righteous living. Very good. And you'll notice that it is, he notices this right away that Potiphar, who has purchased him out of slavery, notices that right away. And then in 39, 21, if you'll look there with me, I just want you to know it's not just a one-time thing. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So again, he now sees another person that is an Egyptian 
that is in charge of the prison and his character, God put, is with him and displays. Yes, sir. You know, I, uh, I watched a very good movie about Joseph one time. It was very accurate. But it brought out something I never gave a thought to before. It doesn't say, and I don't know how much this might be happy in itself, but the penalty for what he did to Potiphar's wife would have been death. Exactly. Not prison. Right. Especially not a king's prison. So Potiphar, I believe, knew about his wife and knew in order to save faith, he had to put him, he had to do something rather than putting them to death and put him in a king's prison. Okay. So that's something I think is very interesting. Okay, very good. Okay, where we were headed today. Anybody else, anything on that? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Well, that's exactly what happened here in this story. Yes, ma'am. Good point. Okay, so let's look at verse, I mean, excuse me, chapter 39. Uh, talking about it and getting to a point, we're talking about the Lord being with Joseph, and I was getting, this is what we were going to focus on mainly today, was talking about overcoming, winning the battle over temptation. Because there are certain things in our life that we need to remember about temptation. Number one, I will ask you, is temptation a sin? Huh? No? Everybody good? Temptation is not a sin. Okay? It is not a sin. So what happens? Temptation is the enticement to sin. Correct? And we're going to find that displayed in something we're going to read in a minute. But then let me ask this question. Is everyone tempted? Is there anyone that gets away from temptation that does not have to face it? Anybody? Okay, good. One, everybody's tempted, even Jesus Christ, everyone is tempted. So as we look at that, he becomes an overseer in Potiphar's house. And then we see that uh, he's blessed by God. He's found favor in Potiphar's eyes. He's told, listen, he knew that the Lord was with him, so we see a situation where now all of a sudden the young man that was thrown in the pit is sold to, in slavery, sold to Potiphar, and Potiphar sees the character or the Lord being with him, it says. We see that he found favor in Potiphar's eyes. So what does Potiphar do? Potiphar does what anybody over top of a lot of things would do. He said, man, I'm going to use this guy. He's, he seems to, everything he does seems to do it right. I'm not only going to start him out with this little job, I'm going to elevate him to the point of he can do anything in my house, and the only thing he doesn't do is do my food. That's it. And so here a guy's gone from slavery and remember now, we're moving through these ages of being still probably a teenager into that. And teenagers can get a little bit, uh, you know, caught up in themselves and being in charge. But uh, please notice that uh, he makes the best of the situation he has, and he knows it's God who has given him the blessing. It's not he himself. He knows that. So he is uh, in a point where... I think we can learn a very good lesson here, not necessarily about a bad uh, lady. 
There's all kinds of warnings in Proverbs about the warnings about women that uh, don't do or don't act the right way. But I think there's a great lesson for us here as we find out that Potiphar's wife now tries to tell, well, we read that he is handsome, probably very nice looking man. There's no doubt the word of God makes note of that. It says that he is that. And she advances on him. And her advance is time after time. And we're not talking about one time. If you'll read it very carefully, you'll notice it happens time after time after time. Now, I don't know how she did it, but she got it to a point where Joseph was in charge of everything, the whole house. And please note, the whole house, meaning everything having to do with everything that Potiphar owned. And so, so he told he told Trudy where to go work today. He told uh, Randall where to go work today. He told Gary. He told Sue. He was in charge of the whole house. But she gets it to a point where nobody's in the house when the incident takes place. Nobody's in the house. And then she asked him to come lie with her again and again and again and again and again and then there's a time when nobody's in the house and she we have the situation of what we're getting ready to talk about how joseph reacted to this come on so i want you to know that uh it's a perfect example of what the word of god tells us in first peter 5 8 there is a roaring lion, and I'm just going to put it on her, seeking to devour your soul. And of course, we're talking about Satan. There is temptation seeking to take you from being righteous in God's sight. And that's what takes place. So if you take a look at that, the temptation, you know, if you will, let's turn together. In the, over the book of James. Do you, if you have your Bible, turn with me or I'll just read it for you. I want you to see this because this is not something that uh, just jumps out there in this story. But here in James chapter 1 in verse 12, looking at verse through verse 15, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We see that being displayed in this lady's life. There is a lust in her eyes for a good-looking teenage boy that is in, or man that is in charge of her house. And that begins to go, and so she's getting to the point of trying to get to sin. But he, of course, has nothing to do with that. Some of the things that I noticed in, about Joseph that uh, we probably need to think about a little bit. Young and handsome. We have him described that way. Good-looking guy. You know, he's away from home. Nobody, none of his family is there. Zero. Nobody there to, nobody there to tell him or tell on him, or tell dad, there's no mother involved. And so he has all the opportunity in the world, but he lets that not be part of what happens in his life. And she does not just come one time, but continuously. So let me back off and say this, ask you this question, and I was gonna do this with the class. You ever been tempted by the same sin more than once? Have you noticed that the one that entices you the most, have you ever noticed which one entices you the most? Anybody? Sure you do. 
Sure you do, because he won't quit. It's going to keep coming. And I just, I mean, there's a way out. I mean, we see it. But my point is the same thing over and over and over and over again. He is enticed. He is made to believe that, you know, that he is all that. And she just continues, then finally grabs him, and we know the situation. And then he was, his response ends up being, and let's take a look at that. Genesis 39, and this is what we were going to really be talking a lot about today. He refuses her and said to the master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. So he is in charge of everything. Everything has been given to him by the master. And he goes on and tells her, there is no one greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything from me but you. Okay? Nothing but you has he committed or or kept from me. I'm in charge of everything. And so I want you to consider that when we think about being tempted. Sometimes everything is put before us, just like it was here in this situation. But we have got to get to a point spiritually in our life where we can just walk away from it. And the reasons for it, number one, was I think that if we'll read there in verse 9, you know, he goes on to say, he's kept nothing from me but you. How can I do this great wickedness Number one, not only against my boss, my owner, but against God. I think it's the primary thing. He recognizes that he cannot be doing this against God. What would happen to us if we acted that way with every temptation in our life? Everyone that faces us, even the one that keeps coming, I can't do this evil against God. And that's the great lesson we can learn from his temptation, I think. Any comments? Yes, sir. Exactly. He does make a very pretty big distinction. She does in slamming him, makes it a racial comment, so to speak, because he is a Hebrew. And, uh, you know, I don't know uh, Egyptians uh, exactly. I'm pretty sure they did not have a great belief in God. Uh, he ends up reacting the way that we need to think about. We're given all kinds of New Testament scripture. Second Timothy chapter 2, 22. Run away from the evil desires of youth. Try hard to live right and have faith in God. In other words, do that. And self-control is something that we need to establish to be able to do that. It took a great amount of self-control because he wasn't going to do this evil thing against God was his point. My point needing to be that uh, Jesus was also tempted. Anybody want to just tell me what temptation took place there? Anybody have an idea? What was he given? What was he tempted with? Three things. What was Jesus tempted with? Excuse me? Food? Okay. He was taken 40 days. For 40 days he was tempted with food, the kingdom. Okay. And he was given that temptation to sin is always in our face. It will always be. 
And there's some practical things that I believe that we can do when we're faced with temptation. We can be tempted, you know, and there's some things that we can do to help us in our temptation. Does anybody have a uh, secret uh, self-help, a go-to card, a go-to phrase that you use when you're tempted? Anybody help us out with the temptation that I'm facing? Anybody help me? What, what, what should I do when I'm tempted? What should Wayne do when I'm tempted? What do you do to get out of your temptation? Tell me what you do. Okay, how do you do that? Okay, anybody else have a, I'm going to use the term, and I don't mean it this way. Does anybody have a trick? Does anybody do something? Go ahead. Run away? Okay, that's what you do. So that's what you're telling me to do, run away from it. I read a guy, about a guy one time that had trouble speaking. Every time he spoke, I, 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 I couldn't speak. But you know what he was told to do? Put a paper clip in his hand and leave the sharp end out. And when he stood up to speak, to squeeze it and, and prick his hand, and it made him quit stuttering, and he talked. So that's all I'm asking you. Is there anything you do? So now I'm still looking for what the answer is. Yes, ma'am. Get behind me, Satan, and you have got to put him there. Exactly. I'm telling you, we all face this temptation like he did, and there's something... Remember, God is in his life. So now let's stop and go to the 40 days in the desert. Taken, Jesus is taken to the mountaintop to be tempted. And what does he do? Well, how does he respond to every temptation? With what? Scriptures. Scriptures the word of God. Everyone. Now, I'm not telling you you carry around a flash card. I'm not suggesting that. You know, that you have something. But think about that. Think about, look, the ultimate sinless one was tempted. We've got the story of Joseph. He could not do this evil against God, it says. Think about Jesus now in Matthew standing there. And what does he immediately respond with? The word of God. So, one of two things have got to happen. The lesson I need to learn from this today is just that. We're going to be tempted. How am I going to react? Is it just a question of I want to keep my moral purity? I want to go to heaven? I don't, I don't know what it is. But we have got to establish somewhere in our mind that there is something that needs to take place in my life. In Joseph's life, he showed us what he did. You can read it there, what he did. And we know what Jesus did. So that's why I asked for a flashcard or something else, what you do. Because I'm always looking for help, me personally. Yes, sir. And I do have some helpers at home that help me, but go ahead. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes it gets hard to recognize because sometimes we walk in a gray world. We walk in a gray world because we've got the right hand over here telling us, no, it's okay to do that. It's okay to do that. And we got the left hand saying, no, it's not okay. And here we are in the middle. And, you know, we're trying to decide because we're walking gray, but... If we're having the faith that he had and God leading us like God led him, there's no, there's no decision to be made about temptation. The word of God is the answer. And I'm not telling you, but I was hoping you were going to give me something quick and easy that I could make an adjustment in my life to get through it. Because I know when I walk out that door, he's waiting. He sure is. He's creeping at the door trying to tempt everybody to do the other. 
Thanks for your good attention. I hope Jed's back, but thank you for not throwing anything. And I appreciate you so much. Have a great... No, I don't think there's quick and easy, but sometimes somebody will say, well, listen, I got these two verses. That's all I meant. That's, yeah. We're good. Thank you very much for your good attention.